back to diversity records before you even get to the tough city you had uh thinking of our master plan is on there as well uh, a lot of gun references yes more gun references on the, on there but um one thing that always intrigues me about this era of rap and how things have evolved so much was on the song you talk a lot about uh, telling people not to sell out and uh, this type of thing. So as you reflect of what you were saying then, how does that apply now? And is it the same or different? Well, think about it from this standpoint, from the very time, from the, from the very early moments of me getting into the game, my mind right after my first experience was about self-ownership being able to be independent and do things on your own. Um, I wanted to definitely push that envelope. Um, I can honestly say back then, it wasn't like my thought process to, you know, like I was thinking, man, I need to, need to go out here and be the banner guy for, you know, you know, self-ownership. I was just really rapping about things that I was involved in and things that, that were surrounding my life. So, <laughs> Whereas if I had really, if I had to do it all over again, I probably would have taken a different approach to the way I went into music or at least the way I went into writing. Because like I said, if Tony played the beat, I would write to it and I would just write whatever I was feeling at the time and whatever was applying to me at the time. So you might be talking about, think about it, thinking of a master plan and control of things don't sound like anything like they don't even sound like they, they could be different artists for God's sakes. And then they got a record call in the party on there, three records, and they all sound like they're going in every direction. And when you listen to Sons of the Father, that's what it sounds like. It sounds like it's just all over the place. And, um, and it was simply because I was young and my mind was all over the place. You get me? Like, I mean, you know, we, we, we're young. I, I wasn't as focused as I would be later on. I was really just thinking, man, I'm in the booth. I don't have a lot of time. I got to write this record and I got to get it out. And that's all I was thinking. So whatever was on my mind at the time, whatever was on my mind at the time, whatever was on my mind at the time was going down on the record. And so if it was, I'm working one second, or if it was thinking of a master plan one second, or if it was who's that girl the next. <sighs> but to me, in hindsight, I almost wish that I would have approached my first album like say a wise intelligence and pro approached the PRT first album because I had all the tools, but my mind was so much on business at the time that I just wanted to put records out so I could get more people out. I, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm like thinking this is a stepping stone for me to go grab other artists and put more artists out. Right. Thus we got ESD, thus we got Poor Righteous Teachers, thus we got other acts to follow right after. At least that was my mindset. So what, uh, that being said, looking into it then, what was the master plan? Because you talked about make sure you have a plan. That was That was the plan? That was it. That was it. Think about it this way. Even though it was very short lived, even though it was very short lived, um, Poor Righteous Teachers was the, the second group, actually the first group, because I wasn't actually signed to the label, but the first group that actually signed to Diversity Records was PRT. So my mind was like, yo, we got to get whoever's, yo, because he blew my mind. He blew my mind. And I was just like, I have to put that guy out. Didn't work out like I wanted it to, but my mindset didn't change. Right. Okay. So then how did you guys end up going from diversity to getting with Tough City? How did that happen? Well, that was my partner. Um, mind you, I'm still just a teenager. And Tim, without having to say it, I think it got bigger than he could handle. You, got, you understand what I'm saying? Like uh, this guy's in his, his mid to late 20s and maybe early 30s at best. And uh, this, this record is growing and this artist is growing and he don't know what to do. And so I think whoever was gonna call him at that moment, he was gonna move. 
And so one day he called me and was just like, hey, uh, you familiar with Tough City Records? And I was like, yeah, I know who Tough City is. I mean, you know, that's Mark the 45 King and those guys. He's like, yeah. He said, the guy who owns that label is this guy named Aaron Fuchs. He wants to meet with us to talk about doing a deal with us. And I was like, Timmy, I don't think we should do that. He said, why not? I said, bro, we're independent and we're just getting in the game. Like, I mean, let's, you know, let's hold out a little bit. And like I said, I don't think, looking back on it now, I know what it was. He couldn't handle it. He, it was getting too big. It was getting to be a little bit much. But for me, those are big problems and good problems to have. For him, it was just like, how am I going to handle this shit? And, you know, and I don't want to drop the ball. And these people, to me, Tough City was really just a, a, a hair above us to me. If we're going to do it, let's go talk to somebody with some real, real, you know, juice. But anyway, to make a long story short, I was uh, I was trying to be a team player. And uh, so when he brought it up, um, even though I was against it, I went to the meeting and all the way there, he just coaching me on like, yo, this is what we should be doing. Like, we should be doing this. We got to do this deal. We got to do this deal, you know, something, something. So it got to the point where I was just like sick of hearing it, man. So when we got there, I remember telling Aaron one thing out of the whole meeting. If we do this, we're going to have to do it like a, a production agreement. And two, if we do this, I'm going to change your label. And I couldn't care less who was on there. And we did. Like you said, you saw all those videos coming out and everything. But there was nobody doing that. Not at the time. I mean, like Kim Shabazz maybe had a, a, a a video here. I don't even know if there was ever a video for 900 number at that time. It came later. Yeah, it was later. It came later. Um, and then, you know, I didn't even know that people like Spoonie G had did deals with, because I was a Spoonie G fan. I love Spoonie G. But I didn't know that he had put out a record or two on Tough City. And I was starting to find, you know, where all these guys they still want YZ. And I was just a young, cocky bull. Like, yo, nah, you ain't going to do better than us. Okay. My mind was on that. And I don't want to sound like I was just really just smelling my own shit. But I was just like thinking, if we're going to do this, man, we got to come full force. If we can't come half-stepping, we got to come in like we know what the hell we're talking about. I'm not coming down with my hand out. I don't need a hand out. I want to come in. And you have to respect us. And so. And then what I mean, around the same, was, around the same time, around the same time, what was the BCM records, the European thing that did the P Funk song? Oh, uh <laughs> damn, you remember you you really do your homework, don't you? Um uh, you know, we we had did like we done some licensing deals with some people back then too, you know. I mean, it was, you know, and then Aaron, Aaron was smart. Like, I mean, for, for what he couldn't do here, he would reach out to other places. And at the time, it wasn't like it was now. I mean, you had to reach out to those other labels where you wouldn't be in those markets. Right. You know, so, I mean, you know, for what it's worth, Aaron is true, but he's corrupt, man. <laughs> And then, you know, it's funny, I'm not telling people that nothing they don't know already. You know what I'm saying? Because I tell us that Aaron's face. As a matter of fact, I got into it with Aaron at his office once. And he, he from, since then, he's kind of been shook of me. Like, I mean, because of things that, that happened there. But I have my masters to this day. Gotcha. So when, uh, on the business side of things, then, were you guys able to do a, do the production deal? Did you do a joint venture with Tough City? Like what happened? Well, what we did was a, a glorified production agreement with them. And at least that's what was quote unquote post, you know, uh, proposed. Okay. And we did the deal. And like I say, we didn't take much money because we had already been recording. We, had, you know, we, we didn't really need that. What I wanted was percentage. I wanted uh, uh, equity. That's what I wanted. But like I say, man, Aaron, Aaron ain't worth the ink that the paper's fucking printed on. Because, he, you know, he'll say one thing. And if had I done my homework 
my real due diligence before me just agreeing to do this with, with Tim, I would have never gotten an agreement with, with, with Tough City, not ever. But hindsight 2020, would we still have the videos and stuff and imagery that we had? Probably not. They probably would have been different images. They probably would have been something different. So, you know, you look back on it and you say, hey, well, this was supposed to happen. Had we not did that deal put right at that particular time, would there be, a, a you know, a, a, a thinking of a master plan video that features Mandela as soon as he gets, you know, released from prison? Probably not. So, you know, it, you kind of like, you got to look at, what do they say? It's like uh, six in one hand, half dozen in the other. You got to kind of take the good with the bad with it. I mean, when I look back on it, it might not be, you know, the, the best thing that have ha has happened for me. However, um, I will say that it was the thing that did happen. Right. And speaking, we'll get to thinking of a master plan again in a second, but with the tower power of the power, you had a video for that too. And um, I, was, I was always trying to figure out the Texas connection. You had the Texas shirts. What was going on with Texas for you at the time? Let me get a charger. Let me get a charger. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. I'll pause. It. Let me get a charger. I don't want it to cut off. Okay. So where were we? I was saying uh, with the tower, uh, excuse me, with tower with the power in that video, you had a don't mess with Texas shirt on. You had the oil fields. You had the Derricks. What's your tech okay. connection? What was that? Okay. Here's a weird thing about that. Um, thinking of a master plan took off in Texas because there was a DJ whom I didn't know at the time. His, uh, his name is uh, DJ Eddie D. DJ Eddie D is out of Dallas. Now, I just met this man maybe three, four years ago and found out the real deal of how my record made it to Texas. I did not know this until about four years ago. Eddie D got the single when it was still on the diversity label and started rocking, thinking of a master plan. Now mind you, thinking of a master plan for us was just a B record, it was a B side. I didn't even do an instrumental for it. It was just a B record. But this dude, hindsight 2020, DJs won the world. He turned it into a hit in Texas so much that it, it became uh, a theme in Houston. And Houston took to the record heavy. And so now we had already shot, we had already shot a video for thinking of a master plan. Um, but we needed to shoot another video. And at this time, at this time, we were thinking, okay, hold on. At this time, we were thinking, hey, if we're gonna shoot this video. What better place than to shoot it than the place is showing us a lot of love, man. Texas is showing us major, major love. Let's go there. And uh, so when we finally found uh, the woman who was going to be behind the video, which a lot of people know, um, a lot of people know who, who was actually behind this video. Her name is Amanda Shear. I don't know if you remember her. Um, when we went to shoot this video, she said, hey, being that we're going to Texas, would you mind wearing like a, a don't mix, don't mess with Texas shirt? And I was just like, you know, I treated that video just like I treated music. You put that beat on, that's what I'm gonna rock. You don't care what it sounds like. So I was like, yeah, why not? And everybody seemed to think that we were from Texas because of that. Um, I never claimed Texas, but I love Texas. I mean, I love what they've given me. I love, I love what they've done for me. They actually helped to catapult my career into you know another dimension another another place and so i i'm in, in, indebted to them uh, for everything a lot of the you, my friends who went on the road with me be fine and promise they're making great careers for themselves in texas right now had we not gone to texas right there from the door Pumas said it best he said i don't even think we would have ended up in texas had we not gone to Texas with you. And so I look at it like that. Like, I mean, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens the way it's supposed to happen. 
And you kind of have to take weigh it out and take the good with the bad. I always, I, things happen for a reason. I always try to make it a good one. So there you go. <laughs> yes. So with uh, Sons of the Father, how and why did you pick that as the, the title of the album? Um, to be honest with you, it's, that's, a, that's one that's hard to remember, except that I was a, the kind of the head of this crew called ESD. And we used to always make references to God. And we used to make references like the 5% nation was like really, really big. But I wasn't 5%, even though I studied like a 5%. I, I never claimed to be a 5%er. Uh, so when I looked at ESD, I often, I often thought of Jesus and the, in the, in the, uh, in, uh, the 12 disciples. You know, we used to make, if you listen to the records, I mean, we used to make reference about it all the time. And uh, even when the record starts off, like, it, you know, it's supposed to be God talking, you know, and uh, or, or a voice that's big like God, you know, to basically say, you know, understand that we are, we, you know, we're just a small, small ant on a, a, a gnat on a dog's dick in, in, in regards to this big planet and this universe that we're a part of. And I just wanted to definitely pay homage to that. So rather than say YZ and the Sons of the Father, I, the whole crew, because it's plural. It didn't say Son of the Father, like, you know, quote unquote, Jesus is the only begotten Son, you know, whatever. It was the Sons, because here we as a conglomerate want to pay homage to this great thing that's bigger than all of us. Be sure to check out the History of Gangster Rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangster Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice-T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangster Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip-hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV back for that WA? Yo MTV has just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.